unless anybody has any objections, but I will show in the order listed on the program so that I, I know people are kind of jumping between panels to make sure they see whatever they want. Yeah. Sorry, there's so many already. Yeah, that's fine. Are you going to sit or stand? I can move the mic. You guys want to stand? You can sit, stand. Yeah, well, whoever's presenting, you know, when you're talking, then you can pass the mic around. I'll put it like that, it's quite easy to adjust. Can we? I'm probably going to stand, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. No, I'll just go. You stand with Thank you. 
right, everybody, it's 3 o'clock. We're going to get started. Uh, so welcome to the Nearsighted panel. We have a super exciting series of talks today revolving around topics like collateral interpersonal surveillance, self-quantification, wearable augmented reality, and the regulation of religious online communities, topics that all relate to various aspects of 21st century surveillance culture. Uh, so just so everybody remembers, I think everybody's already been tweeting a whole lot with the hashtag, but the hashtag is TTW16, and our panel hashtag is B3. Uh, and so anybody else who's following along on the hashtag stream from afar, just please let us know if anybody has any problems uh, either hearing or seeing the live stream uh, so that hopefully somebody can get on that and make sure that's working. Uh, my name is Lauren Burr. I'm a PhD candidate from the University of Waterloo uh, up in Ontario, Canada. Uh, my work focuses on critical uses of uh, GPS technology and pervasive media. And I'm going to introduce our panelists and then we'll get started. Uh, so our first panelist for today is Natalie Saltiel, who is a master's candidate at the Oxford Internet Institute, studying interpersonal surveillance, persistent data, and changing evidentiary paradigms. Jesse Patella is a practicing doula and independent researcher who is interested in feminism, female embodiment, and reproductive justice. She holds an MA in philosophy from Duquesne University and an MA in theology from the Graduate Theological Union at Berkeley. Maggie Mayhem is a San Francisco-based sex worker, doula, and home funeral director in training. In her spare time, she enjoys running marathons, hiking with her dog, eating vegan food, and running a harm reduction crack pipe distribution program. Tony Liao is an assistant professor at Temple University. His research, which examines the development and effects of augmented reality technologies, has been published in leading communication and technology journals, such as New Media and Society, the Journal of Computer Mediated Communication, Information Communication and Society, First Monday, and SIGCHI. And last but not least, we have Ruth Surya, who is a PhD candidate at Texas A&M, researching new media, religion, and gender and sexuality. She received her MA from Copenhagen University and her BA from Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and she loves long walks on the internet. So <laughs> each panelist has 12 minutes to present their paper, uh, and we'll try our best to stick to that time so that we have lots of time for questions from our very large audience. So I will give it over to Natalie. My talk is clearly about uh, uh, personal surveillance and persistent data, which is why maybe it's a little ironic that I'm being recorded now. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely almost decided to just give a talk about that. Um, but so I usually like to start with um, this quote from I'm getting in front of it um, from Bowman and Lyon who basically talk about surveillance as something that is bigger than the way that we usually think about it. And I mean, they refer to it as, as a kind of liquid surveillance that sort of goes beyond the way we usually think about surveillance in terms of government surveillance or corporate surveillance or even social surveillance and lateral surveillance. And to try to examine how the culture and logic of surveillance sort of permeates into more personal, domestic, and intimate relationships. Um, so um, usually when we talk about surveillance, the metaphor that we really can't get rid of is the idea of this panopticon, which can be useful for certain things, but I think at this point, misdirects and conceals more than really it helps when I think it's more necessary to think of um, of the model we have now as a record producing model that stores data by default and passively and doesn't require the active monitoring and watching. Um, watching is rather replaced by searching. And 
all of this information is stored and accessible, um, accumulating to present a temporal and spatial record that makes previously um, invisible information persistently visible. It provides unprecedented access to a vast anthology of information that was previously not fixed in an accessible medium. While physical documents like handwritten letters or personal journals have existed as records, digital technologies have greatly expanded the scope of what can be captured and introduced methods of storing and retrieving information indefinitely. Like this talk that will show up now for a while, anytime somebody looks for me. Um, Digital communications create a backlog of information that can be easily accessed and shared beyond the original context. Phone calls, emails, text messages, network, social networking sites, et cetera, you know, everyone knows. But the expanding network of internet connected technologies contribute to a cohesive, persistent record of an individual's daily activity, or what I will define as a digital witness. If digital footprints are considered to be discrete digital records, the signs and indications of an individual's electronic activities. Digital witness can be understood as the aggregation of these varied and multiple pieces of evidence. I've elected to redraw the issue of persistent data records and pervasive technologies using the concept of digital witness in order to accentuate its evidentiary and probative properties. Digital witness is the technological proxy that is increasingly being used as an evidentiary record, summoned for verification purposes. When we call upon it to testify, we are asking it to affirm the truth of, to bear witness, and considering it legitimate as a knowledgeable entity. It has become a trusted source that demands our, we be accountable to it. Um, I'm not really going to talk about affordances here, which a lot of people have tried it as appropriate, and I wrote about it in my paper, but I don't have time for it. But, you know, you guys know the path that, that will inevitably go down. Um, okay, so this will get, it's a little silly, but I will explain. Um, so from there, the concept of trust for me is, is really central and really important because when we trust the technology, I feel that we are trusting it more than we're trusting a human account. We're letting it take a place or sometimes even precedence in a way that we used to have to rely on a more human to human sort of risk. Um, I mean, trust is an incredibly broad concept and it's almost impossible to define, especially with something as particular as interpersonal relationships, but I'm going to try to a little get where I'm going. Um, when I think of trust, I consistently return to the background art of the Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner cartoons. The chasm between the two rocky cliffs is somehow always insurmountable, and the, the risk and the leap, leap of faith that the coyote has to take in order to cross it and reach the Roadrunner which of course in his case, he never does and he always falls. Um, <laughs> but the idea that that space between is kind of necessarily always gonna be there, I think is really important when we start talking about the technology because interpersonal trust always involves this risk and almost never offers a guarantee. In this context, I would argue that digital witness is potentially serving as a trust in escrow has become a sort of insurance, a backup plan that is never that never has to be activated, but provides reassurance by the fact of its very existence. People lie and have incentives to lie, but we assume the technology does not. In my strange cartoon scenario, the digital witness acts like a net that guarantees the coyote never hits the ground. So, sort of like that, just, you know, because. Um, In essence, it is an articulation of trust but verify. The question of whether the digital evidence is accurate is almost irrelevant, although of course it's not relevant and these records can lie. But we believe that they don't and we believe that they act as legitimate proof. Um, 
For me, it's directly related to this phenomenon of picks or didn't happen. We assume the completeness and existence of records to the extent that even their absence is enough to provoke suspicion. Um, ultimately, I wonder about whether it's the existence of this record insulates us from the risks of trust and encourages us to trust the technology more and other people less. One of the most obvious places this is playing out is within the legal system. Over the past few years, digital records have been increasingly used in evidence in civil and criminal cases. Um, one of my favorite examples is a recent dispute between um, Ellie Cloherty and Joe Lonsdale, one of the founders of Palantir. The case is convoluted, I'm not going to go into it, but after Cloherty accused Lonsdale of sexual assault and emotional abuse, he created a website where he released the archive of their past communications to serve as proof that she was lying. Um, so he, these are all their email, like all of their emails, some of the things that are redacted, but basically saying, like, I didn't emotionally abuse you, look at all the things that you said. Um, he did it to force her to be accountable, to reflect the past and contradict her own testimony. In doing so, he assumes our trust in the accuracy of the digital record and that we will have more trust in it, its objectivity, than in a potentially flawed and biased account. The record itself is considered unimpeachable. Email archives have long been used in cases involving corporations and companies, banks being a, a big one, um, but bringing communication that was exchanged in a very intimate context into a legal setting is a much more drastic parallel. We rarely think about being, of being accountable in such, to such personal exchanges, especially because, because before the technolog technological tools afforded the production of accessible records, these were sort of the sorts of exchanges that were not committed to an archivable form. Um, there are a ton more examples, but I clearly don't have um, time for them, but one of the major issues that's coming up with this is in divorce cases. And uh, lawyers with um, the divorce group that I brought the acronym up have even started to recommend digital privacy clauses for prenup and postnup agreements. Such clauses are intended to block spouses from using personal texts, emails, or photos as evidence in legal disputes. Applications like oh, no, um, MFI, Tiger Text, Kate, Cover Me, et cetera, are all surveillance tools that partners are using to collect information on and monitor their partners with. Um, we've internalized this culture of surveillance. And uh, this, for this paper, I used a data set, um, oh, okay, cool, it's not fine. Uh, there was a whole a survey of 15,000 people in a pan-European context that asked questions about their spying habits. And one in four people actively monitored their partner's <coughs> online activity, and one in two were confident that their partner had not checked up on them. So even though people weren't actively checking, they were aware that they could be checked on, and they didn't have confidence that they weren't, because the idea that their record was something that could be sifted through um, re really resonated in that way. So just to wrap up, what is <laughs> my point? Um, the use of digital witness has the potential to reduce the risk of trust by allowing a partner to access information while simultaneously reducing the risk of discovery. This low discovery risk and the awareness of it is manifest in the relatively high proportion of people who are uncertain about whether their partner accessed their digital records. Partners who surveil necessarily believe that the information they are accessing is legitimate and potentially illuminating, and in doing so, reinforces such records as accurate reflections of their partner's behavior. Um, I guess that's... Up next, we have Maggie Mayhem and Jesse Catella.
you go first. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jesse Patella. Um, we are here giving a presentation together. We're both doulas. We work uh, to advocate for uh, women and their childbirth experiences. And um, I'll let you introduce yourself, and then we'll start the talk. I think we already had a great um, introduction, and I do think the key thing is, is that we're speaking today as doulas and non-academics, and we're speaking about the practical experiences and things that we're seeing in the field and um, drawing some conclusions about what self-quantification is doing when we look at pregnancy. All right. Um, okay, so past theorizing the webs have given a lot of attention to death and digital technologies. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, and much less to pregnancy and birth in relation to digital technologies. So our concern about that is that it points to like a larger erasure of women um, and their experiences in tech communities. Um, and a good example of this is Apple when they rolled out the, their health tracking. Um, they didn't do anything. They didn't have anything that correspond that talked about um, uh, ovulation, vaginas. <laughs> yeah, nothing. Nothing <laughs> about ovulation. Vaginas. Nothing about periods. Um, this seemed to be problematic, and so there was kind of an outcry against this. In the wake of this outcry against like a complete ignoring of women's issues. There has popped up a ton of digital technologies that have uh, looked at um, and monitored pregnancy and people who've tried to con and issues of trying to conceive. Um, while these technologies have been fairly attractive to a lot of women who are trying to conceive and to pregnancy for a variety of reasons, some of which have to do with the fact that it makes them feel in control of their own pregnancies and also that it um, gives them a sense of community as women who are trying to conceive and pregnant women um, upload information and data about their pregnancy and their experiences and talk about uh, talk to other women about this we are afraid that there's a couple or there's three like broad issues with uh, all of these technologies we're going to talk about them in turn with emotional issues medical issues and legal issues but before we do that we're going to talk about the technology itself Alrighty, so apps. If you go to the app store and you search for pregnancy, you're going to run into like millions of apps. And they tend to fall into different categories of taking data from people. Uh, a lot of these apps are going to be about how many um, kicks you can feel from the fetus during pregnancy. Some of these apps are going to be tracking nutrition and they have a background framework of what the uh, ideal nutrition for someone who's pregnant should be. Um, how often uh, are you sleeping? Uh, how often are you exercising? What kind of exercising? A lot of tips on how to do pregnancy the right way. <laughs> how to do childbirth the right way. Um, and so I'm just going to show you some of them. Uh, but I also want to point out that a lot of these technologies have been developed by people who are not, um, who are men, uh, who have never experienced pregnancy. Some men do experience pregnancy. I want to acknowledge there's a lot of gender diversity um, in pregnancy. Um, that is absolutely real, but by and large these are this is technology coming from Silicon Valley And sometimes in the apps you can see small tells or reveals that this is technology That's being developed by people without a lot of good data or personal experience or information uh, The doula contraction labor coach um, Conflates doulas and midwives a midwife is a health professional and your smartphone is not the same as having a midwife at your side um, Here's something that I noticed on this. This is a contraction monitor. This allows you to hit a button when your contraction starts, and then you hit a button when it stops, and then you say how heavy it was. And the note on this was, definitely felt that one. Good thing I was sitting down. Um, if you are having a very strong contraction, I promise you're not on your phone leaving a note. Uh, you're also going to be going through hundreds, um, even potentially thousands of contractions. Um, you don't need to document every single one. Um, all of these apps basically are the same exact product. They just cost different amounts of money from $10 or they're free with ad support and also tracking your data. Um, they come at different levels of pink. Um, they also, <laughs> yeah, or floral. Um, they also sometimes will give you tips about what you should be doing. Um, at this point, this, uh, this particular app will tell you when it's time for you to go to the hospital. Um, however, that could be potentially dangerous because you should be going to the hospital based off of what a lot your, um, your own knowledge is telling you and how you're feeling. Um, if you're relying on your app for when to go to the hospital, like, you're lost. You should go now. <laughs> um, 
Here's another thing I noticed. Um, the apps are also in many ways about kind of moving the authoritative knowledge of pregnancy away from the person experiencing that pregnancy to um, a mediator. Um, in this case, thanks to your app, I called my doctor in time. Um, thanks to your self-knowledge and knowing that something felt funny, you called the doctor on time. Um, so that's definitely something, and as you go through all these apps, you'll, you'll notice a lot of these quirks, and um, most of them have the same kind of base functioning, the same algorithm. A lot of times you're paying $10 to download WebMD's pregnancy section, and that's freely available. Um, you don't really need to pay for most of what these apps are selling. Um, so what are some reasons that people like this? There's a demand. Uh, there's a huge consumer market for this, and people are very interested in knowing about their pregnancy. Um, some of the pros are, if we have more knowledge, maybe we're going to have better birth outcomes. We'll have better diagnostics. We'll be able to put information in the hands of care providers when people transfer that care on. Uh, there can be a sense of control. There's a lot of fear and uncertainty and anxiety about pregnancy. And if you have some information, you can have a sense that maybe if I'm documenting it, I'm in control of it, I'm on top of it, um, it's not controlling me. Um, it offers a chance for community to engage with that pregnancy, to engage with the baby before you've met them, um, to engage with other people who are pregnant. Um, but in general, it's better birth outcomes is the theory. All right. So part of the problems, though, so those are all positive things about it, and this is why women are engaging, um, or pregnant people are engaging with these technologies. Um, but we, as birth professionals, have seen like some of the negative outcomes of these. So first of all, like it turns your pregnancy uh, into a commodity. Um, so a lot of the slides that Maggie was showing, the one in particular that talked about um, the app kind of saving you. Um, capitalizes on fear and turns your pregnancy into something that um, uh, is totally detached from you. Uh, our biggest problem with this um, is that it creates a sense of alienation from one's own body. So um, one of the things that I was thinking about in terms of like why it is that women become attracted to these um, apps while they're pregnant is that often like the self-reporting of women to doctors gets completely like ignored. Um, and so having these like data points become something that then we can say like, look, we actually are having these experiences that we're claiming to, uh, or that we're feeling. But the problem with this is that this then turns it into not looking and not paying attention to what it is that's going on with the women, with the women themselves. Um, in birth rooms, for example, we're going to talk a little bit later about um, fetal, fetal monitoring, but it comes into play here too when women in labor are put on fetal monitors and the monitors are the things that are paid attention to and not the people who are in labor themselves, which is a very, very like common thing. Um, it also um, serves as a form of surveillance for pregnant women. Um, and it can like increase anxiety and decrease like pleasure. So the way in which we saw that it increases anxiety is that even in these like forums where they go in and are um, sharing data, for example, with each other, things that wouldn't necessarily uh, cause concern when you're thinking about things on your own become a cause for concern. Um, in terms of the community, one of the other issues that we um, have come up against is that it causes a normalization and standardization of the process. So, um, or in other words, when comparing data points that one gets from their apps or from uh, their doctors, um, things that are within the realm of normal become like uh, um, cause for concern when they're compared up against uh, the data from other women. Um, it also increases intervention. <coughs> so uh, all midwives and doulas will tell you that like, uh, there's an increase in intervention when there's more data that's collected. Uh, and we'll talk about that in terms of fetal monitoring. Um, we definitely wanted to process this with a form of monitoring, and that's electronic fetal monitoring, and it's often done continuously. Uh, and that's when they take a little digital sensor, it screws into the scalp of the infant um, in the process of labor, and it gets you a lot of information about how that baby is doing. And it's looking to, um, to identify distress and to intervene and have a, a C-section or another form of uh, protection as soon as possible. And uh, it was uh, namely for epilepsy that was uh, considered to be a lack of oxygen. It was thought that if prolonged labor was going on, it was creating this condition. But there has been no uh, change in the epilepsy rate. There's been no change. 
Um, and in general, what it seems to have functioned the most for is it allows for staff deficiencies to um, go on in a hospital. Electronic fetal monitoring is not a substitute for a nurse, and it doesn't replace having a, a really good, uh, well-staffed ward. Uh, and we also noticed that with the electronic fetal monitoring, here's the very interesting stat. We have 38 extra cesarean deliveries, um, so that would be considered um, unnecessary cesareans. Um, 30 additional forceps deliveries um, or instrumental per 1,000 births with continuous versus intermittent. And intermittent monitoring is when you come into the room, you listen to that baby's heart rate, and then you leave, and you're looking for a pattern as opposed to a sudden machine fluke that kind of starts beeping. Uh, cortisol versus oxytocin, birth and pregnancy really wants oxytocin, that's the love hormone. Midwives will say that um, what, what got the baby uh, in is going to be what gets the baby out, that <laughs> oxytocin. Uh, lights and flashing and blinking is not conducive to oxytocin. Um, and it can increase cortisol. Cortisol can prolong, stall, labor, and cause complications. Um, also, a lot of this uh, new technology fails to acknowledge that there is a human rights foundation for a healthy pregnancy. If we don't have healthy food, if we don't have healthy water, if we don't have clean air, you're not going to have a healthy pregnancy and delivery. So we can have all the apps we want. Uh, one thing we could do to change birth outcomes right now would be, for example, to have clean water in Flint, Michigan. Um, things like that matter. So low-tech interventions have a huge, huge uh, magnitude of effect. Legally, this is a very big deal. Um, Right now, since uh, the National Advocates for Pregnant Women have been tracking, and since 2005, there have been 400 women who have faced criminal charges for the outcome of their pregnancy. Um, this means that we now look at miscarriages and stillbirths as potential homicides, rather than tragedies or losses. Um, so as we collect data, what's happening with this? Um, and especially when we start to see increased amount of legislation, that says reckless behavior is criminal behavior when it comes from a pregnant woman. Um, this is the only form of uh, basically health tracking that could potentially follow you into court because it's not considered just your body. Do you want to talk? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, our main concern with, uh, while we don't think that these technologies are necessarily bad things on their own, we also want to point out that like no technology is uh, neutral. Um, and that it could be very problematic in a uh, milieu in which women are getting like prosecuted for their behavior in pregnancy for women to be self-incriminating and like collecting a ton of data on their pregnancies um, that can be then like used against them. <laughs> um, and in conclusion, um, while we believe that we can gain a lot of valuable information from these technologies, we do want to complicate the relationship between these new digital technologies and pregnancy. Um, and we want to highlight the ways in which cooperation in our own like monitoring and surveillance, um, in the case of pregnancy in particular, can lead to a greater control and discipline over our own bodies. Thank you very much. <laughs>
and of course with the very highly publicized Google Glass and other kinds of wearable uh, devices for people. And it was around this time that there was this big burst of enthusiasm for consumer augmented reality, right? The one day videos and the tech blog saying, oh, it's finally out of science fiction, AR had finally arrived. And a lot of these browser companies were receiving millions of dollars of venture capital. Uh, and the first AR industry conferences started around uh, 2010, promoting this new augmented uh, future. Of course, they're pushing things like this that say, look, mobile, mobile, app, mobile phone development uh, took an exponential growth curve. AR can be the same. We can have a billion users by 2020. Of course, in, the ret in hindsight, we see that uh, the numbers weren't really materializing. There were a lot of downloads, but the gimmick wore off. Here's people saying AR has the highest attrition rate for any category of apps. Only one in 10 users that downloaded ever actually return. That's why it's being given such a bad name, because it's more like a gimmick and not really useful in people's everyday lives. And of course, in January 2015, Google announces that they're ending the Google Glass Explorer program, and it's this epic fail, and everybody gets to laugh at Google for having messed up for a change. Uh, and somewhat overlooked, amidst all this industry schadenfreunde uh, that you know, claimed that people knew it all along, they really underemphasized the second part of that announcement, which was that Glass wasn't dead. Glass was just uh, retooling towards industry and enterprise uses. So my talk is about how this is actually reflective of a larger shift in the AR industry with really important assumptions and implications for management, work, and labor. So I'm not going to get too much into theory, but I draw heavily on the social construction of technology, which argues that it's the social discourse surrounding a technology that shapes the imagination, negotiations, and constructions of the technology itself. And it's particularly in these early stages where people don't necessarily know what augmented reality is that the goals, problems, and intergroup negotiations will structure their priorities, their problem solving, and then their design, which I think is reflected in the things that we see. I also won't get into the specifics of the data site, but from about 2011 to present, I've been going to industry conferences, standards conferences, and, uh, and uh, academic conferences. Uh, here's the map depiction of the places I've gone, and I should thank the NSF uh, for funding me to go to all these places. Uh, supplemented by interview data with people who are speaking uh, at these conferences, uh, academic uh, standards uh, and industries. And so what I started noticing around 2013 is that there was a shifting move at these conferences from consumer to industrial futures. Even before the Google Glass announcement, many AR companies and advocates were already moving away from the consumer problem space towards a much more narrow industrial and enterprise. So at ISMAR 2013, they had industry day devoted to things that industry might need. Throughout 2014, Google Glass was ramping down their uh, rhetoric about Glass and their Explorer program before announcing that shift finally in 2015. And in spring of 2015, a group of companies formed called the Augmented Reality for Enterprise Alliance, specifically targeting these companies. And along the way, their futures started changing. Instead of the killer app for augmented reality, they started looking for uses within companies and B2B sales, like warehousing, or construction, or maintenance and repair. Uh, and here's a, a CEO of AR company sort of gloating. A few years ago, everyone was talking about consumer AR. Now where is everyone, right? Uh, that's why we, the smart ones, have been focusing on these enterprise applications, like this SAP and Vuzix video of a crane operator using augmented reality to see where are products they should pick up. As well as a shifting industrial promise, now instead of saying, hey, consumers, you might want to use this in your everyday life, they started talking to managers and saying, hey, we can save your worker 20, 30 minutes a day. We know that worker works 2,000 hours a year, 250 days. Now we can scale it down because we know what you're paying them. And this is in the context of them partnering with a store uh, called Mallwart. I can't say the real name uh, because it's not official yet. Uh, but uh, they're trying to equip their sales associate staff with uh, these devices so they can look up any one of the thousands and thousands of products in their store uh, without leaving. Along the way, there's a shift in the problem spaces because of the focus, right? When it was consumers, it was about marketing, advertising, and entertainment, right? And the recognition of 2D glossy images like magazines. And it had to be colorful, stylish, and high resolution. With the industrial focus, this changes dramatically. This is uh, someone repairing an armor turret. Uh, requires AR to recognize complex 3D objects, uh, precision over style and graphics, and here's someone from the same AR company saying, look, we need to work on recognizing metallic surfaces and low light surfaces where these people actually uh, live, so the problem priorities change. As well as the design of these technologies, 
Google Glass was designed aesthetically to look cool, although you might disagree. Uh, though it's relatively lightweight. Its functionality was it was always connected with Wi-Fi and camera, fairly unobtrusive, uh, because it was designed for convenience, right? They kept saying that it's there when you need it, out of the way when you don't, so it's up and to your right, not in your direct line of sight. Well, we start looking at some of the new industrial designs that are coming out. Here's Vuzix M100 and M200. We can see they're specifically targeting these enterprise commercial and medical applications. The screen is directly in your eye space because it's designed to prevent you from looking away from the task that you're accomplishing, so no context switching. Uh, no wireless necessary because of the context in which uh, you might be using this, so they actually highlight that as an advantage. Uh, the battery was a problem for Google Glass, so they said we can just add on an attachment for a battery pack that people can take out with them uh, into the field. And very interesting, Google Glass was just an exposed lens. Uh, Vuzix says the enclosed eye box is really important because you might be out on the field site with ambient lighting. You don't want your augmentations to get washed out. And so we specifically designed it so it was enclosed uh, into uh, that space. Right? So the design is starting to reflect these priorities. This is the latest generation of AR enterprise devices that came out in 2015 which emphasizes sturdiness over style, right? Because the environment they're trying to sell to has very, very specific requirements for the technology. So ODG used standards that were military standards and specifically geared towards the oil and gas industry. So the material is this standard, all military specific hardware has to have this designation. The protection of these lenses is standard protective eyewear for industrial environments rated eye protection, defense against hazardous materials. And the safety, this whole device is uh, adherent to this ESD standard, uh, which is the oil gas industry standard for anything that has to be on an oil rig. You can't drop it in a bucket of oil and have the whole thing set on fire, right? So uh, that's designed specifically so it won't blow up. Along with this, a very important move to industry is that they no longer have to worry about voluntary use, right? Because Google was like, hey, who's going to wear these devices? And the answer turned out to be no one. Uh, with consumer design, they had to be stylish, and you wanted to wear them with certain levels of functionality. They had to be lightweight, comfortable with this long-lasting battery. And these issues are totally bracketed by the industrial space, where they openly admit employers can just make their employees wear this stuff. I don't care if that sounds draconian. That's just the way it is. Right? And so that's how you get these you know, stormtrooper-looking uh, daiquiri smart helmets, which is another one of these latest uh, design uh, iterations. As well as the tracking uh, for, uh, that's available and possible through these technologies. So they say sometimes you send people out into the field, you don't know what they're doing. One of the benefits of the AR device is they can automatically log the work, but also allows managers to make sure they know what people are doing uh, when they're out you know, fixing power lines or out uh, repairing things uh, in the world. So with this sort of shift that we're seeing towards the industrial space, uh, I argue that these visions are not only fundamentally different applications, they have drastically different requirements for the technology and what the technology ultimately will look like. Because by setting it in this environment where it's no longer voluntary and you can make people wear it and you have the work requirements that it has to work around, it definitely brackets off a certain set of problems that the consumer AR space couldn't solve, right? Associated with consumer AR, but then actually shifting the priorities of the companies and the hardware companies, the software companies, uh, and the promises that they're making uh, related to AR technology. Right? And I think the labor assumptions that are built into these devices are really important to map because one thing is that they're targeting high-level managers who have the power to make people wear them. Okay? It's not like they're creating an AR app that's so instrumental to your job that you would want to buy it and wear it. They're actually specifically targeting the upper-level uh, management. This is also reflected in the tasks that are chosen for AR applications, where they're used as physical tasks that entry-level employees will do. So construction, maintenance, uh, and repair, uh, and warehousing. Right? Those are the tasks that need help with AR, or AR can help streamline uh, for these companies. Another assumption that comes through in these promises and the partnerships that they're making is that it delegates training to this technology where all new product info will be uploaded onto this device, right? So we no longer have to train our Malwart employees uh, anytime they uh, need to uh, have new products come out. And also that companies can now have a direct line to what sales associates will say about that product, right? So they could write in a little blurb that says, hey, sales associate X in any random place in the world, when you look up this product, you should say this blurb about this thing, and that'll standardize the pitch to everyone. 
And closely related to this is this argument, and this is related to uh, Solon's uh, and Katie's uh, uh, paper in the last panel, was that it starts to uh, make uh, m employees more expendable uh, and substitutable and less specialized, right? Because in theory, at least, uh, you no longer need someone specialized if the device has all the info. So you don't need a home and garden person. You don't need an automotive person. It's all on the device, and all of those products uh, are easily accessible. And as well as this tracking argument that uh, these devices will be used uh, to enable users' perceptions to be tracked in remote locations outside of the actual uh, business itself. So as more and more industries move toward adopting these devices, uh, DHL just signed a deal with Musics for their shipping uh, people to wear. I think it's important that scholars begin to understand these technologies and their implications because no one feels the prescription of new information and communication technologies more than those who are forced to work with them every day and whose livelihoods depend on them. And I think when we theorize the web, uh, too often we overemphasize consumer use over industrial enterprise use because it tends to be that a review of the IS literature reviews very little uh, empirical work that's been conducted at the industry level of analysis, which I'm hoping uh, to remedy in some of my uh, future studies where we go to these places that they're being pilot tested uh, and see what people actually say about this. And I think these kinds of shifts in technology are really important to map where, you know, once the consumer part falls away, maybe we forget about it, right? But I think actually this is now the important moment to study the specific ways that these emerging technologies are shifting, who is pushing the development and for what purposes, the power configurations of the places that they enter, and then the implications they have for design, as well as their uses, as well as the people who ultimately come into contact with them. So thank you very much. And And our last speaker for the panel is Ruth Surya. Hi, so uh, if any of you want, there's some chairs around, and I think you can move around while I put on my PowerPoint. I come from the exotic land of Texas, and I'm also a PC girl, so my PowerPoint will probably not fit into the Mac. It was much more nicer design when it was on PC, but it's okay. I guess we can use Mac if we must. Um, hi, so my name is Ruth Tesuria, and much like the previous presenters, I want to talk about surveillance and um, regulations and words like control and discipline, and I want us to think about them at the level of technology, but also at the level of social control and social discipline, and how those things happen through the devices we use, but also through the discourse that we use them for. Um, so, I don't know if you can see, but usually when we think about the relationship between technology and society, there's two extreme theories, right? The first theories, or the one set side can be described as the technological determinism, right, which Marshall McLuhan is always being blamed for, um, where we just think that whatever we use formulates us, right? So if I'm using this mic and I don't have like a little ear mic, that makes my presentation fundamentally different, right? Um, on the other side, uh, we have the social shaping of technology, which Tony or Shredder mentioned, right? Where it's not the technology that shapes us, but rather our choices as an industry, as management, and as consumers, as users, as developers, uh, shapes the technology. And we tend to think of them, at least in, in literature and academia, as two different binaries, right? Like it's either the technology is shaping us or we are shaping technology. Um, but in the studies that I'm hoping to engage in, and this will be my little disclaimer here, what I'm about to present is uh, my dissertation or the work in progress that one day will hopefully be my dissertation. So um, much like Google, I'm hoping to 
take advantage of your feedback and free labor for my own gain. <laughs> so again, so I'm trying to think about this relationship with between technology and, um, and society. And instead of thinking about them as binaries, um, I'd like to think about it as a more harmonical device, right? That together, this in the middle would be us, right? And we're pushed by both of them. There's media logic or technological determinism that forces me to hold the mic in this way, maybe. But then there's the social state shaping of technology that decides that if I want to do like this and then drop the mic, right, I can do that too. And specifically in the religious context, that's why we have the little R here, the religious social shaping of technology is very um, pivotal for what I'm about to present. So I want to take a few steps back and take you back in time of to August of last year, um, to Jerusalem, where the LGBT Pride Parade is taking place for about, I think, 15th time uh, in Jerusalem. And I want to show you Shira Bensky, who is a 16 years old ally, uh, walking with her friends. Because if you've ever been to Jerusalem, and if you've ever been to the Pride Parade in Jerusalem, this is not an event about that has anything to do with homosexuality. It's an event that has to do with liberty and equal rights and vegetarianism and people who are secular and basically anybody who wants to not necessarily be in the mainstream of what it means to be a person living in Jerusalem. Um, so Shia Bensky, like many of her friends, were walk was walking uh, in this parade, marching with her uh, friends, and she was stabbed to death uh, by an ultra-Orthodox man named Ishai Shlisol. Shlisol was actually, uh, this was, he was released from prison but a month earlier, where he spent 10 years uh, because of a previous stabbing attempt he did in the LGBT uh, Pride Parade in 2005. Uh, a parade in which I was walking, and in this previous parade, the one where Shira got stabbed, my baby sister was walking. Um, so this is a very personal. <laughs> Thing for me. So after this horrible murder, the, in the Israeli internet was uproaring. Um, people were talking all over, this is all in Hebrew, about uh, what happened, right? Is this person a crazy man, a, a lunatic working on his own device, or is he somebody who is informed by ultra-Orthodox Jewish uh, uh, mindset? And if he is, who is inciting him, right? So some people who said, oh, you know, there was little to no incitement because basically the ultra-Orthodox community doesn't even mention homosexuality and definitely do not say go out and murder uh, LGBT individuals. But this one uh, LGBT activist um, who's a prominent person in the LGBT community in Israel um, made this long list of people that she blamed for this death. Uh, among which people like Netanyahu and the uh, mayor of Jerusalem. But at the end of this list, she mentions two websites. One is called Bechadre Chadarim, and the other one is called Kikara Shabbat. And these are two digital websites where ultra-Orthodox ultra -orthodox community uh, comes and meets and discusses things. So my question when I saw this was, what's going on? Why is she blaming these websites, right? Isn't it good that we have ultra-Orthodox people going online and, and you know, being open and using the media to open their mind and explore new realities? Um, because when you look at the literature that exists, most of the literature uh, about ultra-Orthodox or religious Jews and the internet, that seems to be the general claim. Right, like once you have access to the internet, woohoo, rainbows and butterflies and everything's great, and you get to be in a safe arena and, and express yourself and learn and you know. And we indeed see that there are these different websites where you can go and, and check all these things, right? You can ask a rabbi about can you or can you not masturbate. You can tell a rabbi, hey, you, you know, I think I might be a lesbian. You can do all these things, which you couldn't do. 10 or 20 years ago, at least not publicly. But what would be the answers that you get? What would be the discourse that is formulated in these websites? So when we look, for example, at the reactions to Shira's death on the website, 
we see that it was strongly condemned. Okay, so by the official website, writers, on uh, one of the uh, ultra orthodox websites, Kikal, it was condemned. Um, you know, it was called a horrible murder, all these strong words. But some words were not mentioned. The words were not, that were not mentioned were stuff like LGBT, pride parade, sexuality, gender, homosexuality, love, or any of those things. So when they talked about this murder, they said things like, there was a horrible murder in Jerusalem. But why? Where? Those things were not mentioned. And when you go to the Facebook page of one of the other Israeli uh, Jewish or religious news sources, you see that, again, the official public voice says something like, this was a horrible murder, you know, this shouldn't have been done. But when you read the personal reactions, you, write, you read things like, oh, I hate all these pride parade, I, I admire this man, right? Or, um, this is very good, like, right? Stuff like that. So of course there is a mixture of, re of reactions. Some of the reactions oh, also condemn, but some of the reactions are explicitly and openly, um, you know, celebrating this murder. So here I think we are starting to see how the media logics, right, the, the technolo soft technological determinism starts playing in. Because what we see is that the personal voice starts acting as a public voice. So the voices of these people, you know, they're not representing a community. They're not representing a news media. But they come together to sort of form a discourse. And so the personal can become public. And I think this is something that all of those of us who uh, research social media or any type of communication media where people talk to one another, struggle with, right? Because there's this thing about this conversation being fossilized. It's a conversation, it happens in the moment, but it stays there forever, right? So just last week I was talking to my baby sister who's 15 and she was telling me about a boy and then she said, oh, we had this really interesting talk. Let me show you, right? <laughs> and she took out her phone and showed me their text messages. And for me that was really weird, right? How can you show me a talk? But of course you can. Uh, because, because it's fossilized. Um, but the thing I really want to highlight here is the idea of, of discourse that's happening. Because it's not happening only on social media and between individuals, it's also happening at the level of these websites, right? So we have people writing about how they love the sexual, uh, the, sorry, the religious um, regulations of sexuality, or why they think it's bad to be friends with the other sex, or um, the, the concepts and gender uh, norms are becoming, uh, are, are, sorry, normalized again through this discourse. Um, and furthermore, when people start asking questions, right, do homosexuals fit into the Jewish community, can platonic relationship work, all these questions, can I stop masturbating, they get certain answers. And the answers would get something like, <laughs> exactly. If you still had time for these thoughts or did, get busier with holy stuff. Because we all know when we do holy stuff, you know, we don't have time for masturbation. So what I'm trying to figure out in my uh, dissertation, and hopefully this will work out, is the strategies in which people negotiate this online spaces in a religious context. And I think that there are a few strategies that are used to create this discourse. The first one is what we saw about the personal voice versus the in, uh, um, regulatory voice, right? Where the, personal person, where the personal voice comes in and doesn't represent anyone, but still acts as a force in the regulation. Um, there's also, of course, the idea of silence, where people are not talking and how the comments section reacts to that. Uh, and all these other um, co concepts of, I don't have time to go over for them. But I, what I would like to highlight is that all of these social concepts that we do in our discourse can be highlighted or normalized through the media logic, logics. So, thank you. Uh, thanks.
thanks again to all of our great speakers today. It's exceeding the bit awkward up here with this many people. Um, so I do want to give everybody as much time as possible for a Q&A. We have almost 20 minutes, which is good. We're doing good for time. Uh, I would like, ask, like to ask all of our speakers, and you've probably heard this before, uh, if you have a question, to make sure that you phrase your question in the form of a question. Uh, so no long-winded commentaries that end in, I don't know if I really have a question. Uh, we'd like to keep things short and concise to give our speakers as much time as possible to respond. Uh, and if you do have questions, uh, we'd like you to come up to the front and use the microphone so that we can uh, catch the audio for the live streamers at home. Any questions? Hi, this is a question about the Orthodox web. Uh, I was curious about the role of advertising on the Orthodox web and what is normalized and what is presented as, you know, what, are, what things are assumed and what things are the kind of, what exists at the higher quality level of sites and what exists at the lower level clickbait level of sites. So yeah, you're right, there are two levels of sites and uh, the clickbait ones would actually have like just, it will just be a bad blog or Google word with just general commercials, right? So I've actually been to some websites where it's discussing some kind of orthodox concepts and then the commercials are like for porn sites, all right? So bad, bad media logic, <laughs> bad use of the, me of the tool, um, but the more, uh, um, I don't know, the more well-established websites would have uh, not only clean advertisements in the, in the shape that they won't have any women on them whatsoever, um, but they will also advertise exactly for that sector, right? So they would advertise specific religious schools or religious pro products, um, stuff like that. Or they would have no advertisements because they have enough money to keep the website without advertisements. There was another question up at the front somewhere. Yeah. Did you want to go first? You can go. Everybody said polite. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my question is for Jesse and Maggie. So, do you see some of the same uh, sort of um, like ovulation trackers and period trackers, some of the same problems with those kind of things as with the pregnancy trackers? Like, do you, um, yeah, actually, we had a kind of a prolonged conversation about that before while we were getting ready for this talk. Um, it seems to me that um, the problem with those sorts of trackers is that all they can give you is like algorithmic information about what is supposed to happen that doesn't take into account like the eccentricities of your own like body. Um, and uh, I think it's less problematic, obviously, because one is not, there's no possibility of one getting a, like, having their behavior criminalized based on, like, ovulation and periods, <laughs> obviously. So there aren't those very, like, large, broader uh, legal implications that we have with the pregnancy trackers. Um, but it does seem like there's the issue of alienation. Um, alienation from one's own body. Um, when there's very obvious, like, signs of ovulation, particularly, like, Women who are trying to conceive like often uh, can track these rhythms of their own bodies um, in a way that can be the apps can distract from that. Yeah, I would say that in general, um, the body is very, very um, individual and it has a lot of variation and it's very sensual. And an algorithm isn't going to get all of the full set of data that our bodies are taking in, like smell, uh, things that we hear. And one of the tricky things about the ovulation trackers is that, uh, again, the authority is in the algorithm. It's not in what you're experiencing with your body. Um, and it's coming up with a number. And it also, it doesn't involve touch. You know, one way to know when you're ovulating is to actually feel your body and get to know what your cervix feels like, get to know what type of fluids you produce. Um, it's not purely a number. It's a, it's a whole body manifestation. And so when you have just numbers, you can lose the self. Um, 
I had a question for Natalie in context of Tony's talk. You were talking about um, somewhat of the, the difference in um, interpersonal surveillance versus, and you mentioned the surveillance of companies, uh, of perhaps their own employees or of their own practices and how that comes up in legal proceedings as well. Um, you know, in, co in context of, I think, really Tony's great talk on, on the personal versus, or consumer versus enterprise marketing, what, can you, what would you say, how, how do these, or how did these <coughs> practices manifest themselves in different ways for companies versus interpersonal? <laughs> um, actually, I have an interesting anecdote related to that. So when I was finishing, uh, writing this, I was talking to somebody who works at Goldman Sachs, and I was talking about the persistence of emails and things being surveilled, and she was like, oh yeah, we completely have an internal system that does basically like a NSA X key score sort of search for keywords that they're not allowed to use, things they are not allowed to say that get flagged and when they say things there is somebody who will get a notification that this employee said this in, um, in an email and they're not supposed to. I think they were also talking about how somebody had recently gotten fired because he was corresponding with his new job he was about to start and like that was how actively they were monitoring their employees um, email exchanges but for me, one of the things that's really interesting is that to a certain extent people, I would say like since Enron, like for a long time have really like internalized the idea that their workplace email is going to be monitored, that it isn't really theirs, even if they're still consistently making stupid mistakes because we all get lazy and complacent, versus like something that's a personal sort of intimate conversation that you're not really thinking about so much as being transmissible into this other context. You're going to have to be accountable for it that way. Um, yeah, so I think this is a really interesting illustration of how the promises and fears get distorted or changed depending on the context, right? So much of the concern around Google Glass was recording outward, right? Using Google to record other people. Whereas in the enterprise context, that is actually a problem where a lot of these warehouses don't allow cameras on the floor. And there's a fundamental mistrust of the workers that these devices will walk off, uh, they won't be secure, competitors will hack into their uh, server space or you know, get their information. And so they had to create these new security devices to wipe them remotely and remove everything if they were to walk off the floor, right? So a new set of promises and technological features related to this idea that the employees can't be trusted. Uh, and then also, the issue of recording became not, can we record outward and the things that you're looking at, but can we track you and the things that you're seeing uh, and have that flow not go out there, but go back uh, to the manager. So I think it's a, a, a really good ex uh, example of the social construction of certain problems or solutions, uh, depending on whose perspective you're looking at. Other questions? Yep, go back. Let me up the microphone. Is that like the worst place for this? <laughs> so this is a question for Jesse and Maggie. I loved your talk. And yeah, I'm wondering, so as someone who uses both quantitative and qualitative ways of being in touch with my own body, I've actually been able to use some of my self-tracking data, the quantitative stuff, to push back against what institutional medicine sometimes likes to think that it knows about my body. And so I'm wondering, have you encountered any cases or instances where women are using these apps maybe in a way that wasn't intended, or in a way to kind of push back against the regime of knowledge that like a lot of these apps seem like they're trying to force on people? <laughs> Um, yeah, I think that's a really great question, actually, and that's something that I was trying to uh, bring up in the talk, which is that like there's one of the reasons that we want to, or one of the motivations for using this is just that, is that um, 
women are kind of systematically discounted, and their own self-reporting is systematically discounted by the medical community. So there is an extent. There is a, a extent to which like gathering like data that one can then present to back up or legitimize their own claims about their bodies becomes very desirable. But um, but I think that's very complicated. So I'm not actually sure what to. <laughs> I don't really have an answer for that. I think that's a really complicated thing. I don't know. Yeah, there's there's no bad tech, only bad patriarchy. Um, it, it's it, this is about how it's going to be implemented, and if it's you're able to use it, it can have it has this tech has so much potential, it has so much promise. This can legitimize someone's experience. Um, some of this tech, uh, you can use your smartphone to record the fetal heartbeat, um, and so often when women are talking to their providers. Uh, they are. They have everything they're saying is discounted. They say they think there's something wrong, and they're told they just have the jitters, or they're nervous, and their claims aren't taken seriously. Or they say they feel really good, and they feel really confident, and they're told they shouldn't be, and their body is too fragile for what it's about to do. Um, so sometimes we do have to legitimize our own experience with something external to be believed. And so there are people who are using this to get better health outcomes for themselves, but that requires the ability to self-advocate. Um, and to engage with the medical institution um, with that in hand. If, uh, if you don't necessarily have the ability to self-advocate, it will probably be used against you. Hi, this is for Natalie. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about the digital witness more in terms of the judicial system. Um, obviously, self-incrimination both publicly and within a legal proceeding happens a lot with digital witness information with emails and texts a lot with um, sexual harassment and abuse I was wondering if you could talk more about that and digital witness um, and how we kind of divest the legal system from using that information Um, that's a, a really interesting question, I think, currently, um, now, especially because it's sort of like early stages and early, early years, um, and people haven't really known how to, how to deal with it. Like, there are a couple things I can think of off the top of my head where people have used or tried to use, um, a lot of information from social media, Facebook particularly, to say that somebody's either um, ill, not ill, for like a disability thing, or guilty, not guilty, from even there, I think there was um, this woman who was accused of killing her fiance in a kayak this past summer, and they were looking at her Facebook wall and saying like, you were posting really happy Post that must mean that you're happy, so you probably killed him. And, um, <laughs> which of course seems like a stretch, and they didn't really go very far with it, but people were really kind of just assuming that this was evidence of something, and that it was true and representative of something that really, taken out of its context, isn't necessarily accurate, but um, I think that there hasn't been a lot of consistency so far with how these things are being used and where they can be used and what they even mean when taken out of the context that they were originally, you know, set in. So, I mean, it'll be interesting to see what happens, I think, but probably messy. <laughs> Other questions? No, that's the so this question is for Tony. Do you have a sense for how workers, who I'm guessing may not all like love the idea of being monitored in this way, how they may be resisting some of those data collection practices, or how those like acts of resistance might then subsequently reshape the technology? Uh, hi, and yes, sorry, I miss uh, I misremembered your name. This is Karen. Oh, uh, from right. before. Um, so. Right now, uh, we are, I, I'm at the conferences seeing the promises circulate, right? I have some anecdotal uh, evidence of workers that are uh, questioning 
uh, whether or not this is technically, they could be or should be required to wear them, right? Uh, and there's some very interesting collective bargaining questions that come up where if it's a material improvement to the job, like an operating system, they can't collectively bargain those things, right? But uh, something else that might be a different kind of category of thing, and maybe augmented reality falls into the operating system category or it falls into a uh, thing that you need to do your job category, there might be different levels of recourse uh, as far as that. Um, there was a, 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 an example of a failed enterprise implementation uh, at Honda uh, back in the early 2000s uh, where they were shipping these augmented reality units out to uh, car repair, auto repair uh, mechanics and saying, you can look up the manual for every car that comes in here on this device, right? And they shipped one out to a bunch of dealerships and it received massive, massive pushback. Uh, because one, auto mechanics don't like to wear this thing and say, hey, I'm the idiot of the enterprise. Uh, two, uh, there were you know, some physical limitations where it restricted their movement to move under cars and uh, other places and it required a middle strap here <coughs> where they might want to keep tools. Uh, and then third was the sort of uh, very heightened awareness and knowledge that if they were to keep using it, the logical extension of this is that maybe some of their coworkers won't be here. Uh, for very much longer, right? So there are a whole host of, I think, really interesting tensions related to what they're promising about the technology and then how these things get implemented and then get reappropriated or objected to by the people in question. And that'll vary by case by case uh, and related to the implementation that these companies take. So, yeah. Other questions? We have about four more minutes. Question um, about the uh, Orthodox um, forum sort of posts, as well as uh, about the um, pregnancy trackers. Um, both of these um, I was interested in because of the way that um, I was thinking about how uh, forum conversations can veer toward vernacular kind of authority versus official or institutional ideas. And you can see that, I think, in the Orthodox sort of discourses as well as mother pregnancy communities that form that have really pretty sometimes radically non-normative views communicated via like anti-vax movements that are really distrustful of like scientific um, or mainstream authority um, as well as sort of the in orthodox communities distrustful of um, normative sort of uh, views of uh, uh, like mainstream acceptance of cultural movements. Um, so I was wondering how you guys would speak to that. Wants to get mm -hmm. Sure. So um, I'll tell you my uh, my pessimistic reaction. Right. I think what happens is that a lot of these places, a lot of these forums and websites start off um, trying to create this vernacular authority, and I can give you two examples in a minute. Um, and then what happens is that uh, they become authorized as spaces in which ultra orthodox can serve and digital tools that they can use by the fact that they accept onto themselves expert or rabbinical authority. And once that authority steps in, it, it stops being a vernacular authority, right? It, they, they, there are things you can and cannot say, and sometimes that happens organically, right? So one example is um, there's a forum where people talk about dating and marriage and stuff like that, and then there's one user who keeps kind of pushing the limits um, and say, you know, it's not so bad if I date multiple boys or if I do this or I do that. And then, uh, and then people started calling her out in the last few months and saying stuff like, oh, but you, you will not get married or you're not doing this right. And this has nothing to do with our society. It has to do with you, right? There's not a problem in the society that you are the problem and almost pushing her out of the forum. Um, but you can see other things. Like, so a different example, and I'll pass it on, would be that there was an, ar an article created by the authority of the website, not a rabbi in this case, a wife of a rabbi, where she writes about like how it's amazing when your husband gets back from work and you're, uh, you know, he's so tired, don't throw the baby at him. Instead, you know, let him rest and make some coffee for him and give him the newspaper and stuff like that. 
right? Like very traditional gender norms. And, and so the entire article was like that. And then the comment section, people raged. They were like, are you crazy? Are you from the 50s? What, what's happening? Like, we also work. So you do see this push and, and, and pull, but overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, the spaces are controlled by um, authorized authority. My concern about this, because I spend a lot of time on these forums looking at what women are writing about, and my concern is, I, I think that there is an extent to which it is like taking back some of the authority, but um, then going back to this idea, of, I, I think it creates like a widespread panic too, <laughs> uh, that uh, is fairly unnecessary um, when we, when there's people who start talking about like the HCG levels that they have and comparing those against like other people's and trying to create like norms around what your levels are supposed to be at like how many weeks you're pregnant uh, when there's really like a huge variance of that from like person to person and um, and no real way of interpreting that <laughs> um, and uh, people who don't have like the ability to uh, or don't have like the skills to be able to do that as if it was even possible in the first place actually um, to make sense of any of that so uh, my fear is that like there's it creates like a culture of panic um, that uh, that is detrimental to the people who are participating in Authoritative knowledge in childbirth is just so interesting because there's so many factors that come into play. And when I, I do think about the role of advocacy is that uh, some people in pregnancy are going to have more social mobility to advocate for themselves than others. Um, and it's, you can really just see a hierarchy of who we believe. Um, and that's influenced by race, it's influenced by class, it's you know very influenced by gender when we're looking at something like pregnancy. Um, and so... It's, it's, always, it's always in conflict and it's uh, changing norms. Um, we all have such a different experience and you're not gonna follow a bell curve as easily. Um, but you do, you see a lot of people who are looking at all this different information and pitting it against one another and coming up with a codified idea of what a good mom is, um, codifying what a good pregnancy is. Uh, and I think that's when we put morals onto it, you know. Um, health, uh, your health status isn't your morality. And I think that's the problem is that we do, we start to attach that to it. Um, and whether or not you're a good mom or a bad mom uh, can determine what side of the jail bars are on. So we are out of time now. Uh, it's 4.15, I believe we have a food break until six o'clock and then we're back for our first keynote panel. But let's thank our panelists. <laughs> Um, just want a quick practical note. Uh, we need to clear out of here really fast because there's another totally unrelated event going on next. <laughs> so if you guys could take your conversations to the cafe, um, that would be really great. And we'll see you back here at six. Thank you. Uh, so you guys, you guys Make sure everybody gets your USB keys back and all of those things. Oh yeah, that. Sorry. Cool. I remember seeing. I don't want to run out of time, but can you take a picture of me with this background? Yeah. It's like I've seen it. Oh, it's so hard. You can do it two hours. <laughs>